Before we get started, I'm going to um, call off the names that I'm seeing and then call off the uh, last four digits of the phone numbers for those that I don't have names for in the system so that Abigail Connolly can take an accurate um, record of today's meeting on who was in attendance. Um, I am showing um, Amarin and Michael from the board's legal team. I'm showing Susan Barrett, Jeff Batista, Lynn Coombs, Abigail Connolly, um, Sarah Kensler, um, Lori Perry, and Patrick Rooney from the board. Um, I'm seeing all five board members on here. I am seeing Orca Media, Kim Sears, Don Bugby, and from that point, I'm going to start reading off the last four digits of the phone number, and if you could just uh, let us know who you are so that Abigail can record your attendance for the meeting. The first phone number are four digits ending in 2505. Jennifer Call is UVM Medical Center. Thank you, Jennifer. The next one is 7438. Ham Davis. Thank you, Ham. The next one is 5001. Julia Saw with the Healthcare Advocate. Thank you, Julia. Uh, the next one is 8975. That's Vaughn Husby and Jerry. Okay, the next one is 8267. Lucy Garrett. Good morning, Lucy. The next one is 9314. This is the court reporter. Great. Thank you. Most important that you were on. <laughs> the next, next one is 9314. That's me again, the court reporter. Oh. Uh, 7081. Uh, this is, that's uh, Eric Schultz with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. Um, are there people that I missed? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff Tiemann with the Vermont Association of Hospitals. Good morning, Jeff. I don't know why your name doesn't pop up. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm incognito today, sir. Okay. <laughs> are there others? I see that Janet McCarthy has joined us now. Um, Good. Anyone else? Good morning. Morning. Did just we to, miss anyone? Just to verify, you have Robin Alvis, Stephanie Bro, and Devin from NMC. Yes, and we figured that we would uh, introduce you at your swearing in so that. Uh, um, is there anyone else? Okay, at this time, I will ask the court reporter to swear in the individuals who are going to testify um, for Northwest. And Robin, if you're gonna call on anybody else, make sure that they're being sworn in at the same time. So perhaps you could tell us the names of people who might speak. Sure, that would include Stephanie Devon and myself. It may also include Dawn Buffy, our interim uh, Administ Administrative Officer, Jerry Barbini, our Interim CEO, and Janet McCarthy, our Board Chair. Super. So um, if the court reporter could swear all these individuals in. One more thing, Robin. It's Dr. Brophy. I just joined late, so uh, you can add me to that list as well if needed. Thank you. Yes. Okay. This is the court reporter. Do you, as a panel, swear that you testify to tell the whole truth and nothing and nothing but the truth will help you, God? I do. We do. I do. Thank you. And if I could just check with you, uh, Madam Court Reporter, are you um, hearing everybody okay and everything good? I'm hearing everything fine, yes, thank you. Okay, if at any point uh, um, there's a problem, just uh, cut in. 
I will, thanks. So with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Patrick and Lori to tee up um, this morning's uh, conversation before we turn it over to Northwest. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board. Um, can everyone hear me? And those following on Skype, can you see my screen? We can. Okay, great. So uh, one point of clarification, when we conclude the staff's presentation, Mr. Chair, do you want to allow time for the board to discuss or should I turn it right over to Northwestern's uh, presenters? I think um, not for discussion, but for any questions they may have of staff, I will turn it over and call out their names in a, in a set order. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, excuse, we will get started. Sorry. Excuse uh, me? Um, yes, when you speak, you'll have to identify yourself. Right now I have a document in front of me on the screen so I can't see people. So if you could just identify who you are when you speak, that would be helpful for me. Absolutely. My name is Patrick Rooney. I'm the Director of Health Systems Finances with the Green Mountain Care Board, and I will be presenting the Green Mountain Care Board staff's overview of the uh, budget amendment request from Northwestern Medical Center. Thank you. All right, so Green Mountain Care Board received the request on April 1st. Um, the day prior to that, Northwestern's board authorized uh, the request to be submitted. The request is a 14.9% increase, which is in addition to the 5.9% change in charge to gross charges that was approved by the board back in September and made effective in the orders on October 1st that were delivered to the hospital. This new request would be effective May 1st. Uh, Northwestern has given us information that shows the 1% value of each percentage point of the increase is equal to about $610,000 of net patient revenue. The gross revenue impact is a little over $32 million for a full year, um, but for the remainder of this year, we'll have a gross revenue impact of around $13.6 million. The NPR impact for the, for the full year would be $9 million, and for the remainder of this fiscal year would be $3.7 uh, you can see in the table below, the NPR FPP that was originally approved was just under $117 million for the fiscal year 2020. They're projecting at NNC that without this amendment, revenue will come in around $108.4 million. And should this um, amendment be authorized by the board at the requested 14.9% increase, the NPR FBP would come in just over 112, so still uh, short of the original budget approval for the NPR of 116.9 back in September. Uh, the reason for the request given by Northwestern was to offset the negative impact of reduced physician practice visits uh, and related ancillary volume due to the Meditech electronic medical record implementation that began about this time last year, or went live about this time last year, and increased cost to patient care staff to the traveling nurses. <clears throat> we did have a few follow-up questions for Northwestern after the original submission that um, we had conversations going through the middle part of April. Um, Northwestern, as of that time, had not yet spoke to commercial payers about this increase. Uh, even if the board is to approve the 14.9, that does not mean that Northwestern and the payer will agree to a 14.9% increase. We wanted to make that clear that um, they had not yet approached commercial payers as of the time that we received our response from the hospital. Uh, we did ask what would happen if it was not approved, and the response was that there would be pressure to reduce services um, that require subsidies. We we're curious to know what the relationship with our health record or medical record. Um, was there a I, problem? I, I, excuse me, Mr. Rooney. Um, yes. You broke up a little bit there. So you'd be curious to know what the relationship, that's as far as I got. Uh, is that, did you hear the part about the commercial payers? Is that what you're referencing? Uh, the last thing I had was, we would be curious to know what the relationship, that's where it ended. 
I'll go back a little further. We did ask what would happen if it was not approved, and the response was there would be pressure to reduce services that require subsidies. We would be okay. curious what the relationship. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so back up because I think the the breakup skewed what I what I was saying um, in regards to the electronic medical record or electronic health record that um, is part of the reason for this request. We were curious to know um, what was going on with the delivery of that. Was there anything um, that would require uh, legal recourse for a failed delivery on the part of the EHR vendor? Um, and they said there is no grounds for that. Um, so we eliminated that as a possibility that there would be some sort of financial settlement in the future that could be to the benefit of Northwest. Um, <clears throat> the adjusted request uh, matches budget utilization expenses. It does not support the budget projections that MNC will reconcile with the 21 budget. And the preliminary COVID impact for April uh, is a 55% reduction in gross revenues. Um, it is important to note that this request from Northwestern is a pre-COVID request. However, we did ask a question about uh, their current situation as it relates to COVID. We felt we would be remiss in our duties if we did not um, at least uh, get some feedback from them. It's certainly difficult to ignore the elephant in the room, uh, no matter what we do in regards to a rate increase. So we wanted to um, ask them some questions surrounding that and um, the 55% reduction in gross revenues is certainly significant as far as a financial impact on the hospital uh, moving into April. Here is how the hospital has laid out the financial impact on their income statement. <clears throat> you can see to the far right hand side the adjusted mid-year request and the net operating income impact that would have when compared to uh, their 2020 projection as of February. It essentially would cut their net operating income loss in half uh, and it would significantly reduce the um, total loss that they have on their bottom line. Um, right now, they are projecting, as submitted to us, about a $13.6 million loss when considering losses in non-operating revenues. Uh, so here's a breakdown as provided by the hospital uh, regarding the reasons for the request and how, <laughs> how that request would be impacted. Um, so as you can see, of the total dollars, the EMR impact <clears throat> from volume reduction, about seven million, and the temporary patient care staff, the traveling staff, is around two million dollars. Uh, they break down further the traveling staff expense impact, and you can see from prior years, it has run between two hundred thousand and seven hundred thousand dollars. And this year, they are projecting a traveling expense in excess of two point three million dollars. Here is a year-to-date view of the hospital's performance. Um, on the very top to the left, the fiscal year 2020 approved budget has been coming in at a loss of $248,000 from an operating margin perspective. And then we have a month-over-month -month view through February for year-to-date. And you can see that from October, um, the first month of their fiscal year, they were in the red $186,000. And as of February, the hospital had moved uh, down towards the $4 million mark um, in negative operating territory. Their projection would put them around $9.6 million for an operating loss. And then you can see to the far right of that, the year in projections with the 14.9% request approved would uh, still cause the hospital to lose significant money, but yet it would cut their um, current projection in half. On the bottom, we have their day's cash on hand. <clears throat> and it moves in a similar pattern left to right from their budget through their actual months so far and to where they are projecting their, their year without the request and where they would with it. And everyone understands the day's cash on hand <clears throat> uh, calculation speaks very 
very loudly during budget times as to where a hospital is and what they can endure should all revenues be shut off tomorrow. Um, so obviously this request would allow them to, um, would have reduced loss would allow them to maintain a higher uh, base cash on hand position than they would have otherwise. <clears throat> uh, through the years on the left-hand side, Northwestern has been uh, in the bottom uh, part of the five-year average approved change in charge um, with their 5.9% that they received last September. Our calculations show them coming here at a five-year average of 0.7% over those five years. Should this request be granted today at the 14.9%, they would move up into median territory uh, compared to their, the other hospitals over the last five years at the 3.7% you see highlighted in yellow on the right. So it would be a significant jump um, from the bottom to uh, upper middle for the hospital as far as average change in charge is concerned. This is the view um, as requested at 14.9% um, around the impact to the hospital. You can see that in September of 2019, the charge was approved at 5.9. That has been effective for almost 60% of the year <clears throat> and would be an effective rate of 3.4%. Proposed from May 1st to September 30th, the 14.9% added to the 5.9 for about 40% of the year would bring an effective rate of 8.7%. In total, for the year, their effective rate would be 12.1%, which for the fiscal year 20, 2020, would be the highest effective rate um, on charges of any of the hospitals. Copley received 9.8% back in September, um, so they would be um, second instead of first now. The NPR dollar change is submitted by Northwestern was just over $610,000, so you can see the full year impact in dollars underneath that and the partial year impact, and in red there is the um, tie out to the loss that um, Northwestern would be projecting should they receive this 14.9%. Here we've taken several alternative views to provide the board with a range um, getting to the same point as the previous slide we have in the top left, a uh, 10% alternative addition instead of 14.9, and we move to the right in a clockwise fashion, 7.5%, uh, which would be essentially half of the proposed request. Below that, we have a 3%, and in the bottom left-hand corner, we have a 5%. So explaining some of the logic to why we chose these different views is the alternative at 10% would provide right here an effective rate for fiscal year 20 of about 10.1%, which is slightly higher than the aforementioned effective rate that Copley Hospital received with their 9.8%. The downside to the hospital there would be that the partial year <clears throat> um, bottom line impact projection would move to 6.2 million from 5 million. To the right, we have the 7.5%, which is half. Half would be a, a, a um, from our view is a good way of measuring what the impact would be for the hospital should they not receive 50% um, of this request. It gives them, still gives them an effective rate of 9%, which would be right behind Copley. Um, and of course, the impact there continues to show uh, a deeper um, negative operating margin. And as we move down, it begins, it continues in similar fashion. The 5% the in alternative three and the 3% in alternative four because they hadn't spoken to the commercial rate payers yet, we wanted to go a little lower on the change in charge rate ladder, if you will, um, in the event that perhaps they do get an approval here today, but the insurance company is not willing to provide them with, um, a contract that gives them everything they want. So we, want, we just wanted to show the board what the impact would be across these different levels of increases should they uh, receive that approval today and be able to negotiate at that rate with their commercial payments. <clears throat> so the next steps are 
following this, the board can have some questioning time, as the chair pointed out earlier, and then we will uh, migrate to the Northwestern staff for their presentation, followed by a board discussion and potential uh, vote. And so with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Patrick. So at this point, I'm going to um, call in reverse order board members in case they have any questions on the presentation from staff, um, and then we'll move to uh, Northwest. After Northwest presentation, we'll follow that same pattern and then open it up for any public comments or discussions before there's um, any uh, possible uh, board action. So in reverse order, board member Yusufer. Uh, no, I don't have any questions on this. I think the presentation was clear uh, with what the ask was. Thanks. Board member Pelham. Um, I agree with Maureen. I've, uh, uh, the presentation was clear and uh, I'm ready to move on to uh, the hospital presentation. Board member Lunge. Same here. Board member Holmes. Yep, I'm ready. Perfect, so at this point, um, we're going to turn over the um, screen to Northwest, and uh, the Northwest team has been sworn in. But again, if you could introduce yourself as you begin to speak so that the court reporter gets an accurate record of who said what at this hearing. Robin? Yes, thank you. Give us one second, please, to pull our presentation up. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, this is Susan Barrett. If the presenters could remind folks what slide they're on, because uh, others that aren't on the Skype call or not uh, the Skype video call are not seeing the presentation, they'll be following it from our website. So that would be really helpful. Thank you. You're start on slide one. <laughs> Correct, and just to confirm, can everyone see slide one? We can. Perfect, thank you. This is Robin Alves, Chief Financial Officer for Northwestern Medical Center. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I appreciate the um, uh, time and attention of the board and, and the staff in preparing for um, our discussion today. I would like to provide one um, clarifying point around our payers. Um, while we, uh, we have since spoken to our payers to alert them that we may have a price increase coming, um, we are not required to obtain their approval. Our contracts allow for, uh, for us with advance notice to increase our rates, so that is not an issue uh, from our perspective. Um, certainly between the time that we submitted our request and um, today, uh, the world in which we live in has changed dramatically. Um, however, the focus of today really remains on our needs at NMC uh, regardless of the COVID environment. Um, so Robin, could I just interject? Yes. So you made a statement that um, you're automatically allowed an increase if the board grants it, but you never provided us with any contract language to uh, verify that. I thought what I read was that um, there was the possibility of uh, a mid-year adjustment. Um, the reason why I asked this question, Robin, is the burden of proof will be on you to demonstrate um, that this request makes sense. There were two hospitals that approached us at a similar time frame this year, and one, when we asked the question, um, went to their carriers and was informed they would not be given the increase and they withdrew their request. So um, you're gonna have to show us that um, you've met that criteria to show that um, an actual increase would be put into effect. Hi, this is Stephanie Rowe, uh, Director of Finance, and I'll just um, jump in as well. Um, we have at this point actually either spoken to on the phone or through email or both um, all of our major commercial insurance carriers, and, and we let them know um, that we had asked for this mid-year rate increase. And, of course, their first question was how much is the increase? 
Um, and so we provided them with that information. Um, the, you know, we haven't heard uh, anything back from a couple of them since telling them what the uh, percentage was. Um, but we did ask them to let us know if they anticipated um, contractually or otherwise any sorts of issues or objections. And again, we haven't heard back um, from a couple of them and from one of them we did hear back and, and what we heard back was, okay, let us know what the Green Mountain Care Board uh, approves. So we have, um, you know, had that conversation and are not, at least at this point, feeling any major pushback from them. So just so that we're really clear and transparent about um, you know, what, what those conversations have looked like and where we've been. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. And this is Robin again, certainly happy to provide the contract language. I don't think that that request was, was clear from our perspective and centered more around discussions. But um, to Stephanie's point, we do uh, have since um, completed that uh, due diligence and uh, have no reason to believe that we will have a, a payer barrier. Kevin, this is Robin Lenz. I had a question related to the contract. Do you want me to hold it or ask it now since we're on the topic? You might as well ask it now, Robin. Um, so you had indicated that the that there is no re approval required with advance notice. Can you give us a sense of what that advance notice is? I imagine there may be a range since you have a number of different contracts. Correct. It's anywhere from uh, 60 to 120 days, um, but most are on the shorter end of that scale. Thank you. And this is Maureen. I'm just going to um, add a question on to that then. For when you're assuming this will take effect, um, since you're looking at May 1st, and in many cases you said the minimum was about 60 days, so in the financials that you're reflecting, how many months are you assuming the rate increase will go through? Yeah, this is Stephanie again. Um, so for us, you know, we because of the timing related to the fiscal year, I mean, our math does show that the rate increase goes into effect in May um, and is, you know, continues through the rest of our fiscal year. So from a contractual standpoint, if we do receive pushback that um, they're going to exercise any kind of 60, you know, day notice or advance before, you know, that takes effect, then then it will have an impact. But again, at the time that we put this together, having never done a mid-year rate increase request before, um, you know, the piece around the payer contracts is a little bit is a little bit new to us. So as we've had conversations with your staff. Um, and as we've gone further down the road of reviewing those contracts, it certainly became clear that there may be a timing difference. And so the rate increase may not be worth um, everything that we thought or were hoping that it would be worth. But, but again, it's a small state with, a, with only a few pairs. And so we're just going to take those conversations one at a time. Okay. Proceed, Robin. Thank you. Again, this is Robin Alvin. Um, as I was saying, um, the, the world in which we, we live in has changed. However, um, our needs existed prior to COVID, and regardless of how the fate of, I think, the country's healthcare system in Vermont, um, hospitals in particular, related to COVID, none of us have those answers. So I just wanted to remind that this is focused on uh, the state of our finances um, pre-COVID. And so um, a lot of the numbers that have been presented don't reflect the changes in the reality, which um, the board should be well aware of um, relative to the weekly uh, reporting that we're providing regarding our cash flow and our day's cash on hand. Um, the two major areas, of course, that um, predicated our request was our Meditech implementation. Certainly has taken longer than we anticipated. Um, as with any implementation, uh, you don't know what you don't know until you know it with regard to workflows, patient flow, physicians being able to um, navigate well in, in the uh, product 
as well as the product needing to um, have certain enhancements that uh, uh, provide ease of navigation for our providers. Um, the trajectory there uh, has been um, increasing, but now that we are at a year, uh, the reality is, is, is that the lost revenue from that utilization um, just cannot be recaptured at this point, um, given that most of this stemmed out of our primary care uh, uh, offices and to, to uh, end with our ortho and our general surgery, the assumption being that those patients need care and, and may have uh, either gone without or um, sought their care elsewhere. Um, the second uh, component um, that was the basis for our request has to do with the use of traveler nurses. Um, that's been uh, an issue that we've spoken about uh, frequently along with the EMR and our bi-monthly financial sustainability calls. Um, at NMC, we provide four levels of inpatient care, critical care, post-surge, and, med and medical, step down and observation. Most of our traveler expenses is related in the area of critical care. That is a highly specialized uh, nursing practice. And the reality is that our tertiary partner is not always able to take those patients in a very timely manner. Um, we have one tertiary hospital in the state that is trying to um, handle their own issues around recruitment, retention, and bed capacity uh, to prioritize the care of, of you know, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. So to that end, we find ourselves routinely having um, lower level critical care. Our critical care only rises to the level of, of um, uh, uh, with the exception of neurology and cardiology, which those patients do go uh, to our ter tertiary provider. The reality for us is that we have very, very critically ill patients who are either admitted for one day before they can um, uh, be transported to our tertiary partner or even overnight in our ED um, until such uh, capacity is generated. So part of what we will talk about later is a partnership with Dartmouth um, Hitchcock around tele-ICU so that we can, uh, one, um, see more of our critical care patients short of those requiring neuro and cardio intervention, theoretically that should help relieve some of the pressure that our tertiary partner has to take um, those patients that really only they have um, the skills and resources to care for. And I'll speak more about that later in the presentation. Um, at this point, we will get into uh, the financial slides. I will turn that over to Stephanie to go through that and where there are some variances in um, our financial presentation and some that may have been presented by uh, the Green Mountain Care Board staff. We will uh, elaborate on those. Thank you. Again, this is Stephanie Bro, uh, Director of Finance at NMC. So this presentation is going to kind of look and feel very familiar um, to the budget presentation we gave back in August because we really wanted you to have sort of an apples to apples comparison um, as much as possible around, you know, what, what does our financial picture look like now um, if we were to get approved for this rate increase and how do we stack up to our peers? So some of this information um, has actually been covered already by the staff analysis, and so it will be a little repetitive, but I will try not to, to, to be um, too repetitive and stay too long. I'll try to move us along here. Um, so this first slide, um, I'm on the slide now called Financial Overview FY 2020, and it really just shows our uh, previously approved 2020 budget and our 2020 projection, again, this was using February um, year-to-date actuals, and so it does not have any impact of COVID. And when you look through these numbers and you really compare the two columns, you know, there's two areas that kind of stand out. Um, but first and foremost, it's that top line, it's net patient revenue. And our net patient revenue is projected to be about 8% uh, under budget in 2020. 
So for us, that's a little over $9 million. And that's a significant miss, right? And this is a conversation we've had internally. And so we really drilled down into those numbers. And while it is significant and it is a big miss, I just want to put into context from an actual budgeting perspective what that means. So when we get together each year and we build our budget, we are doing it really at that department and at that service line level, and we're doing it by provider. So we're going into our systems and we're looking at each provider and we're looking at, you know, how many days are they in the office doing clinic? How many days are they doing surgery? Do they have any admin time? And we really try to be very specific and very realistic. And so what this miss equates to is really the difference between budgeting, you know, 20 patients a day for one of your providers when really you should have budgeted 18 or 19. And that's it. You know, it's really that sensitive. Once you start applying that towards, you know, 365 days in a year or 52 weeks and, you know, your entire employed medical staff of, you know, 40 or 45 providers, the numbers do add up that quickly. And so I hope that's helpful. I just wanted to provide that context. And as Robin said, a lot of it is related to the implementation of our electronic medical record. We went live almost a year ago to this day. And so you get some early wins. It's so new for everybody. And so you get some early traction. But really, you know, you find yourself at this stage in the game nearly a year later, still going through optimization, still going through upgrades and trying to improve things. But the low-hanging fruit is gone. And so we will be much more conservative and very careful when we budget for fiscal year 2021 now that that hindsight is 2020 and we've had some lessons learned. The other area or line when you compare the two columns that I want to speak to is the operating expenses. So you can see that our operating expenses are projecting to come in about $1.5 million over budget. 1.7, so the entire variance and then some, is related to two things. It is our traveler costs, which Robin has already mentioned, mostly ICU nurses, and it's our self-insured health claims. We're not asking for a rate increase to help cover the difference in our self-insured health claims. We understand that that program, we will have a loss on some years and we will have a win on some years. However, the traveler expense and just how significant that expense and that need has been for our organization this year is something that we do ask your consideration for. The actual favorable variance that exists in our expenses once you strip those two things out are really a result of us doing what we can where we can to reduce our staffing in order to live with these new volumes and these new utilization figures that we see. So again, some of our costs are variable, some of them are fixed, but I want to assure you that where it's appropriate and when we can, we are adjusting those staffing models and sending those folks home. And so we're going to talk more in this presentation about cost reduction and what we've already done in terms of cost reduction, but also what we still have in process or what we know is coming in the future in terms of cost reduction. The next one here is our operating margin. So again, the staff presentation covered this. We filled in our 2019 actual here. It was projected back last August when we did this presentation, and we came in at a negative 8% operating margin. If we use our February year-to-date projection, our operating margin would be a negative 9.7% for 2020. And if approved for the 14.9% rate increase, our operating margin is still projected to be a negative 4.3%. 
And again, this is all without any impact of COVID. I'm on the slide now, um, so-called financial health key metrics, and this one is day's cash on hand. So what we've done here, very similar, we've updated everything for you, and you can see that um, Dave's cash on hand is projected for us at the end of 2020 to be 182 days if we keep doing what we are doing. Um, we are not only doing a lot of expense review and cost reduction and management on the operating side, but also on the capital side as well. So we are being very selective um, with our capital spend right now. We are looking at every project, does not matter if it was previously approved or not, um, everything has been reset and is back to the drawing board um, so that we are being very careful and very thoughtful um, exactly where we are doing our capital spend. So. Um, if you folks already have information about what our intentions were in 2020, we really backed off of that quite a bit. And so my numbers might be a little bit different than what you've seen um, from the staff presentation. If we were to be approved for the mid-year rate increase, I project that our day's cash on hand would end the year not at 182 days, but at 197 days. And again, that is without any COVID impact. And then I really made a note here uh, at the bottom just to remind uh, you folks that our bond covenant is a minimum of 100 days uh, cash on hand. I'm now on a slide called historical compliance with budget orders. And that's gonna be the next few slides um, because we wanted to, you know, realizing that a 14.9% mid-year rate increase request is significant and it is large and it is going to make us an outlier in this year. There is no doubt about that. Um, so what we have attempted to do is show you that here, um, but also show you over a period of time, um, over a range of time, I think your um, presentation before this one went back mostly to 2015. I do have some information that actually matches that same time frame um, that we'll see in a couple slides. This one goes all the way back to 2011. Um, and what this shows us is that even if we were approved for this rate increase, it puts our average annual increase at 3.82%, that red dot at the very end, with the median of our peers having an average of 4.67%. So we feel um, comfortable um, that we are still doing something that is appropriate for our organization. I'm on to the next slide now, still titled Historical Compliance with Budget Orders. And you, and you guys have a very similar slide um, in the presentation before this one internally. We refer to this as our waterfall graph. Um, and so we went back on this one to 2011, the presentation before this went back to 2015 and put us in the middle of the pack. If you go back to 2011, we showed you this back in August and we were in uh, second place there, just um, slightly better than Copley. And this rate increase, if we were approved for the entire 14.9% um, under this time frame, shows that we would still be in second place, but much closer to the rest of the pack, not so much of an outlier anymore. Um, Copley would still be uh, behind us and uh, Springfield just actually slightly ahead of NMC. And uh, uh, this graph is still titled Historical Compliance with Budget Orders, and it's a price comparison graph. So this one is the same time frame, 2015. So uh, apples to apples with the presentation before this one. And that presentation showed us very much in the middle of the pack, and this proves that as well. So the price of a procedure at NMC that cost a dollar um, back in 2015, if we are approved for this rate increase would now be $1.18. And the average of our peers 
would be at $1.19. So again, we wanted to make this request thoughtfully and carefully, and after looking at this data and this information, feel that what we're asking for is still appropriate and it is still reasonable when you look at us in comparison to the other hospitals in Vermont. So thank you, Stephanie, for that. And the next two slides really will speak to our efforts around cost containment and areas that, you know, as Stephanie has demonstrated, we're not relying on a rate increase to solve all of our issues. We are still very aggressively pursuing savings opportunities. What you have on this slide, slide nine, cost drivers and cost containment, what we've already done, much of this you saw in our presentation back in August and have been implemented. That was almost a $6 million savings. And those savings that were already completed were incorporated into the budget request that we made in August. What have we done since August is slide 10. The first staffing reductions in our hourly staff before this meeting at 9 a.m., NMC, our executive leadership presented a voluntary reduction in force to every single employee in our organization with the exception of care providers at the bedside and physicians. We expect and hope that this will be the savings that we will realize out of a voluntary reduction in force. However, we most likely will also have a forced reduction in force. That being said, we can't rely completely on the rate increase that we're asking for, nor can we rely completely on the cost savings. We cannot cost our way out of the significant top-line revenue issue that we have. Other areas of reduction are with the providers at $700,000. That is mostly related to service line discontinuation that we have already achieved or are in process. And then a reduction in RISE Vermont. That's not only a staffing reduction, but we were supporting a lot of these activities locally in our HSA, also supporting state endeavors that are significantly above our peer hospitals across the state. And this was a decision to right-size that investment. Also, we talked about elimination of leases. We had a couple of leases come due that we did not renew. We either eliminated that program or we were able to bring that service line onto our campus where we do not have to pay rent. We also eliminated a concierge program. This was a very patient-friendly program that would help our patients being discharged that had transportation issues or difficulty in either obtaining medical supplies, their pharmaceuticals, or even groceries to allow them to recover at home. We eliminated that program. And also, we are nearing a completion of a redesign of our health care plan for calendar year one that will yield about $750,000 in savings. We've also looked at revenue-enhancing strategies in the areas that speak to a need in our community, if not in the state. One of those is around the sleep program. We have a very talented pulmonologist who is partnering with us now to create a sleep program. What programs still exist in the state have waiting periods of up to four or five months. And this is an acute need that has very costly impacts to the system for patients not being diagnosed with sleep disorders that then create other chronic illnesses that require a higher health care spend for those patients. 
Secondly, we, the tele-ICU program, um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is our partner there to improve our ability and our skill set in the area of critical care. One of our challenges with um, uh, recruiting ICU nurses is that we um, don't consistently have the population that an ICU nurse needs for us to have to maintain their skills. The same holds true even with our traveler ICU nurses. They typically will come maybe for one assignment, but then they move on. And the reality is that we can't um, at this point in time, we do not think it is in the best interest of our community um, nor our um, patients to, uh, to not offer critical care services, as I said, short of neuro and cardiology intervention um, patients that do need to go to our tertiary partner. Um, other things that we are um, considering, of course, would be additional service line eliminations where there may be a community partner that can uh, carry the burden of that need for our community. Um, finally, I would just like to wrap up and say that while this isn't, uh, this request isn't predicated on COVID, um, we certainly know that with respect to our EMR and all of our challenges, that had we not been on a single EHR, the challenges of um, caring for patients and on, on a shared health record and to the extent that we have had to retrain and mobilize and cross-train providers to ensure a safe environment in our very small physical footprint um, has been uh, tremendous. And I think that it has been very affirming in a need for us to stay the course um, with a single EMR. Um, what would be our next step? I think uh, Patrick alluded in the presentation, they asked us that question. What is our contingency plan if we uh, cannot get uh, or are not approved uh, with our request? And the reality would mean that we would have to consider eliminating core services that no other partner um, exists in the community to provide or are, are not able to handle the scale of um, what we're contributing. I'd love to elaborate um, on that more specifically because I think if I'm in your shoes, I would be curious as to what that means, but please um, just respect that we um, do not want to um, alarm um, any of our patients, our community, um, and our providers uh, prematurely. Um, since a lot of those decisions are predicated on the decision that you reached today. At this point in time, that concludes our presentation, and we are happy to take any questions from the board. Thank you, Robin. Um, and again, I'm going to start in uh, the reverse order and start with uh, Member Maureen Usper. Uh, thanks. And thank you, Robin and Stephanie, for the presentation. Um, you know, I'm really going to address, I know your ask is really based on two things, the EMR impact on volumes and the temporary patient care staff issue uh, totaling uh, 9.1 million. Um, but just to take us back a little bit, uh, you know, your capital budget for the EMR was in the 2018 and 2019 budget with the capital spend um, over $2 million, which the costs were split over those two years. And we know that the project was um, started or was actually being utilized in May 2019. And the goal was to bring the efficiencies of the offices. They, I guess they had to deal with two systems. The patients were often receiving two bills. So it was to get everybody up onto the same platform. So that concept Obviously, it seems good, and you know, it seems like you made that decision for the right reason. Where I'm having some issues with the number of the impact of the EMR piece, the seven million, which is the prim primary driver of your request, is in a few different areas that I'm hoping you can kind of discuss. One is, um, you know, at budget when you presented your 2020 budget. Um, which I know was back in August, probably pre when this started, 
um, because you probably built your numbers in April, this really was not addressed as an issue. In December, on your narratives that you gave us in December, um, you specifically said the short-term efficiencies and improvements related to the new systems and workflows have been made. The contractual allowance rates are running higher than budget, and we believe that the variance continues to be the primary cause or the ACO payments and the risk reserve assumptions. So just to bring you back there, in December, you had brought your NPR numbers down uh, from your, your full year forecast in December, but at that time, you said the reasoning was because of the ACO payments and risk reserve assumptions. Then in January, you brought up the issue of having it relate to the um, new system implementation. And for the January piece, um, you specifically said that the volumes related to the outpatient physician practices and the ancillary revenue results from these visits continue to be our most significant revenue concerns. Um, some practices, primary care pediatrics and orthopedics, continue to be challenged by the effects of the electronic record implementation that occurred in May. Multidisciplinary teams have been striving to improve the workflow efficiency within the program since go live, resulting in incremental improvements. We've reached a break point in the work and will be increasing the number of available scheduled visits in primary care and orthopedics. This increase will be easier for some of providers to absorb than others, so it will require a ramp up to fully achieve volumes across the board. So one of the key questions is how much of this miss is related really to some startup issues? And I want to add a couple more points to what you also discussed. And one of the things that you said, Robin, in your comments was that, um, uh, pull up what you just said. Um, that basically, you know, this, this part of this myth was because of um, those people went away to, if they had orthopedics, they went somewhere else. If they, if they had a need for an appointment, they didn't come back. But that's a current year issue, not necessarily a future issue. So, you know, how do we reconcile that this is all lost volume that won't be, that won't come back, specifically tied to the EMR? So thank you for those comments, and, and certainly um, uh, appreciate that you, you've gone back and sort of tracked the timeline. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the biggest thing for, uh, for us and any implementation is that you go into it expecting a certain timeline and trajectory, and you either achieve it or you don't. And a lot of, lots of times those timelines are, are predicated on assumptions that just don't hold true and you can't know um, until you're living the day-to-day -day, um, impact on uh, patient flow, um, provider volumes, et cetera. Um, I think if I understand um, your question is how much of our re request is addressed to lost revenue versus something that will be ongoing. Um, I think that's a very fair question, and my response would be it is, a, it is a mix of both. I mean, we have seen some patients clearly that needed to be seen. You've seen a rise in our ED volumes. You've seen a rise in our urgent care, uh, or we've seen the rise in our urgent care. Um, but it has more to do with the referrals that primary care visits generate and that lost revenue. Um, to our specialty providers or um, is, is a pent-up demand. Um, we do not anticipate at least for the next probably two years to have significantly increased volume. And as a result of that, it is changing our recruiting plan to ensure that we add providers to meet the access demands of our community. Can I ask a follow-up on that, Maureen? Sure. So in August, when you came in with your uh, budget presentation, um, you already had four months underneath your belt of the switch over to Meditech. Now you're a year into this. Um, 
where do you see yourself going um, and why haven't you been able to address the inefficiencies? Yeah, I mean, I, this is Stephanie. I would like to jump into because I, I'm not surprised in a way that some of these, um, you know, explanations that we've had to provide along the way, it seems like a roller coaster because I'll tell you that's exactly how it feels. Um, so when we came in August, we had been live for four months. However, our budget had largely been put together, you know, not in August, but again in April. Um, before we had actually gone live or, you know, maybe a little bit into May, but we really didn't know. And so I think when we came in August, it was, hey, we've put our budget together. Since putting our budget together, we have gone live with this system. And you know what? We are experiencing some issues. And so we're working very hard to get those issues resolved because this budget relies on us getting those issues resolved. It depends on it. And then we provided you with commentary. I forget, Maureen, if it was November or December that said it referenced short-term gains. Um, and that's where I, I referenced in my presentation that there was a lot of work done and there was some things that got fixed. Um, whether we had to change workflow, whether we had to work with Meditech and take an upgrade, um, we were able to do some things to make the system better than it was on May 1st when we flipped the switch. And I think everybody at NMC would attest to that, um, mm -hmm. that it is better now than it was. However, I think then you hear in our commentary that, you know what, we've kind of got that low-hanging fruit, and now we're at a point where we think this is actually starting to take shape where we know what this looks like. We know what living with Meditech in the long term looks like. And so we know that it is going to cost us a little bit um, on the number of patients per day because it is more labor-intensive. Um, that system from a documentation standpoint, from an ordering standpoint, et cetera. Um, there's other really good reasons to keep the system. Um, there's other really significant wins. Um, but from a pure, I can only see 18 patients a day or maybe 19 instead of 20, I think we are understanding that that's absolutely our new reality. Um, and, the, and you're right that the other thing that's really impacting our net patient revenue is the ACO, but we did not make those ACO challenges part of this request because we understand and you folks understand that that's a risk-based system, right? That's a risk-based program. And so if we were going to come here and say, you know, part of our rate increase has to do with the fact that we are not performing favorably under that ACO, and therefore we're having to add more risk reserves to our balance sheet or whatnot. We didn't feel like that was a fair thing to do, considering there may be a year where there is their shared savings, right? So we intentionally did not want to muddy the waters with COVID. We also did not want to muddy the waters with the ACO. Okay, and I'm glad you, you know, aren't muddy new waters with that, but I, I just still do have a disconnect between the December where you brought your numbers down from 117 million to 111 million in NPR and really stated it was related to the ACO and risk reserve. You also brought up the reimbursement rates that you were getting, I think on Medicaid were going down by like eight points and you said that also was reflected in these numbers um, from what I read. and. Can you talk about that as well? Yes, um, and Patrick and his staff actually did a great job asking us a question that we responded to yesterday about the ACO because it's complex and it is multifactorial. So on one hand, when we had prepared our budget originally back last April or May, we had a certain reimbursement rate for Medicare and then it ended up that we had we and everybody else had been getting overpaid for Medicare and so there was a payback associated with that. So that's one issue that was being caused. Um, another issue, and I think we did bring this up in August, was, you know, hey, our budget assumes that we do not have an adjustment to our income statement for risk reserve, right? I am not budgeting to have to pay back a million or two million or whatever the number is and have to add those to my 
reserved on my balance sheet. Some of that is coming to fruition. And again, we don't want to make that part of this, of this request, um, but that is happening. And then the third thing that is happening is just small shifts in either payer mix or procedure mix where the amount of um, procedures that we're doing that we get reimbursed more favorably on are the ones that we in this year are doing a little bit less of. So therefore the procedures that we're doing more of don't have quite as favorable of a reimbursement rate. And so that you know creates a small difference in your contractual allowances. Um, so there's, that, that piece is pretty complex, but again, we've tried to keep that out of this request just to be um, clear and concise. Okay, because I mean, so, so just then focusing on the seven million that you were going down in the EMR impact, um, you know, I would assess that situation as there's, you know, two things that would have needed to happen. It's like, one, when do you anticipate you'll get back there, right? Which is either because you can, um, again, it was lost, it walked out the door this year, but it should come back. And then if you don't get back there, you know, how do you restructure those areas to accommodate lower volume um, and eliminate the expenses, which I know you've done some expense reduction, but if this is a systematic problem where you are no longer going to get the $7 million revenue year over year, then the infrastructure that supports that $7 million has to have significant overhauls um, to make the change. Because, you know, I do look at this request. I understand it doesn't get you all the way back this year, but the request is a, is a full get you all the way back next year. You know, if you had started on a, a full year basis, this $9 million ask gets you back to where you would have been for your operating profit for the year. And, um, you know, I just would have to believe some of this is is not going to stick for the year in, year out, that you're going to lose the $7 million. And if you do, then, yes, you would need to make significant changes to your infrastructure rather than to rely that a commercial rate increase is going to bring you up 100%. And, of course, the 14, it's 14.9, but it's actually about 20% on services in the hospital and nothing um, in the physician areas, correct, which is the, also the area where the EMR was taking the most impact. Um, I believe four million of the seven million was was came from the primary care. A million was surgical. A million was general. So I mean, it, it's kind of there's some disconnects there, even on where the rate increases are coming in, um, and the fact that you're not going to get any of that seven million back. So I'm not not sure whether you can address that or not, but that's um, that's a big concern. Hi, um, Marie. This is this is Robin. Um, happy to address address that, and um, I think it's important to um, to realize that while this is a significant request, um, it wasn't what it wasn't to get us completely whole. We know that there is restructuring and uh, changes in workflow um, with support staff that need to occur, and we're planning on making those changes. We we have made those changes. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, is uh, important for you to realize is that to see to see 18 or 19 patients compared to the 20 is still taking the entirety of the support service because of the length of time in navigating and scribing um, in order management, referral management. Those are the areas that we have, um, I think, the best opportunity and we have seen some um, uh, significant changes in. So I do think that we will be more efficient and we have had to at attack this in a variety of options around support service. Um, also, I think this is a, another silver, silver lining of COVID. Um, Ironically, we would not have been able to do telehealth had we not been on Meditech, and Meditech stood up the virtual visit capability literally within a week with our, our team. And what that has shown us is that 
to help offset some of the efficiencies and really a belief that telehealth is here to stay. It gives us some flexibility in our scheduling to improve our daily throughput of patients because we can intersperse um, telehealth visits which, which are much more clean in terms of the, the documentation and those visits don't require support staff. They don't require uh, MAs to round with the provider. It gives the provider actually a little bit of a breather to get caught up in wrapping up um, the documentation from the face-to-face -face patient that they've seen earlier. So hopefully um, that addresses some of your concern um, and, and rightfully so about what what are we doing to bridge the gap on the efficiency. I would also like to say that anytime you are looking at an EMR change, you have to factor in a learning curve based on the product that, that they came from. If it's paper, it's a much more significant gain than if it's another um, EHR. But the previous EHR, and we had more than one, um, uh, was not, was going to have to change regardless because it wasn't designed to keep up with the volumes that we were experiencing in the expansion of our primary care presence here in our community. Um, okay. I won't keep going over that, but um, so the other area was uh, the temporary patient staff care, which was about two million of the request. And just looking at historical where you've spent um, in 19, it was 690, in 18, it was 385, and this year projected to be 2.3 million. Um, so you're asking for 2 million of the rate increase to offset um, that change. Um, just want to understand what are their offsets for that specific area, right? If you're, if you're putting on uh, temporary staff, it's because you don't have the staff that you, you either budgeted it in regular staff, right, or, or you just completely missed it on the budget. But there should be some offsets in your regular staffing specifically related to those temporary nurses that you have to recruit, um, also knowing that volume is down. So, um, yeah, happy to address that. A couple of fronts in terms of just the specialized care that we need um, and that we have been supplementing with uh, travel nurses in our ICU. Um, I mentioned previously our partnership with Dartmouth. Um, that is going to provide us with uh, support that we didn't have before and allow us to actually keep more of our patients so that we can retain and not rely on, we can have a critical care program that will provide um, enough challenges to keep critical care nurses satisfied as a regular employee. Um, that is something that factored heavily in, into our decision with, with tele-ICU. We can't be in a position of not having enough skill set to care for even one patient that may arise through the ED that needs critical care. I mentioned the four levels of service that we provide um, in this hospital. You know, a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse. I can't pull someone from my labor and delivery and then go and expect that they can manage events. Um, so there are some scale issues with respect to the staffing and the skill set needed to care for four different levels of inpatient or outpatient observation care. Um, okay. And just one other question on um, your metrics on days cash on hand. Um, and on the slide you showed, um, I think through February, you were down 10 days on cash on hand. And from March through the end of the year through um, September, you were anticipating going down another 53 days. So just kind of reconciling that because, uh, you know, again, this system went in in May and your day's cash on hand has not really taken much of, a, of an impact relative to where you were for budget and now it's supposed to really dive, I know, unrelated to COVID. So just trying to understand why you know, it's going to drop so significantly in the next, um, the, the latter half of the year, when in the first half of the year it was down 10, 10 days. 
Yeah, I mean, I thank you. This is Stephanie. And I think when we say, you know, this, this request is without the impact of COVID, you could argue that the major significant declines in the market are or are not specifically COVID. And so I think what, I just want to make it clear that, you know, we know at this point what some of those market declines are, um, and that is being included in here. Um, however, none of the operating type um, COVID expenses, whether it's the lost revenues um, or the supplies and equipment that we've had to purchase is part of that. Is that clear? Yeah, so if we just did this piece only, what would your day's cash on hand have changed based on without COVID, without any of the other things, just this component? Uh, I could get back to you on that. I mean, the, the loss of these closed our month of March. Um, we are just about to close our month of April. Um, so I've had that, that foresight and that information when putting this presentation together, but I could calculate that specific piece for you and get back to you. Okay. It, it, it is pretty significant. It's probably, you know, at least 15 days. I was going to say, $6 million, yeah. our market loss last month alone was $6 million. Yeah. So that's a significant so. number of days. Yeah. Oh. Okay. That's all I have for now. Let some other board members chime in. Thanks. Okay, Member Pelham. Thank you, Ch Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Maureen, for uh, leading the charge here. You've, your questions are always insightful and uh, and helpful all around. Um, for me, I'd just like to set a little context here um, that, uh, you know, Nor Northwestern is a hospital with a, a relatively weak payer mix. Um, their commercial uh, is at 49.2 percent. At least this is in uh, 2019, and uh, the system hospital system overall is at 54.1 percent. Uh, Medicare's about about even, but Medicaid uh, Northwestern's at a 17.6 percent, and uh, the system is at 11.4 percent. And so, you know, to me, those uh, those background um, uh, statistics you know, do have have. Uh, uh, you know, cause some em em empathy for Northwestern situation. I mean, I, I do note that they're um, from 2017 to 2019, their uh, cumulative uh, operating margin has dropped by $13.9 million. And uh, as noted in the presentation, uh, their five-year charge approval uh, has been seven-tenths of 1%, which is the second lowest among hospitals. But that said, um, there are some uh, in this presentation, some numbers that, uh, uh, you know, I, I think need some scrubbing. Uh, Maureen mentioned the issue of uh, the uh, traveler's amount relative to, to the trend. And uh, I just want to kind of point out that the average uh, amount for traveler expense from 2016 to 2019 was 423000 And now we're looking at a $2.3 million dollar. Uh, uh, amount in just one year. And so I know you spoke a little bit uh, about that uh, in answer to Maureen's question, but that, that is a significant scale up. It's a 550% increase. And um, I'm just wondering if, if, uh, um, if you can speak to that again. Sure, happy to do that. While um, uh, the majority of our traveler expense has come in ICU, we we still have other provider categories that we did experience traveler expenses in. That had to do um, with our respiratory therapy. Um, again, a very small uh, staff. We had someone out, I think, on FMLA and then in ended up leaving that we are currently recruiting for. Um, and so we could not be without um, our full complement of respiratory therapists, um, especially during COVID. Um, we've also had uh, some um, absences of FMLA and or departures um, with uh, in our diagnostic imaging around some of our radiology technicians that we had to also um, uh, utilize a, a travel contract for. I think the long-term plan and what we haven't mentioned is our investment and partnership with um, um, you see, I always, Vermont Technical, yeah. around the nursing program, VTC, 
and um, the fact that we will be um, investing heavily in trying to grow our own nurses. And one of the uh, future travel mitigation strategies is this partnership with Dartmouth-Hitchcock because we will have um, the ability and support to allow our nursing staff to flex more greatly within their skill set because we do have um, that support and monitoring from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Also, as I've said, we need to reach that footprint of critical care that, um, that makes, it, makes it profitable and, and to support the resources, those fixed resources that we have to have in place for those patients, especially coming from the, from, you know, the Northern Kingdom that may not, that 30 minutes between us and, and uh, UVM, even if they had capacity to take the patient, could be the difference in life and death. So uh, let me ask a hypothetical. Um, if your EMR system had worked as planned, um, and therefore your demand for services were, uh, was higher than it has been, where do you think your um, a need for travelers would be if, if your EMR system was working up to par? Uh, completely unrelated, would not have had a, a, a single impact. Okay. Um, so I'm looking a little bit at, at kind of uh, uh, NPR history here. And um, I know that in your uh, 2020 uh, budget over your 20, uh, <clears throat> over the, uh, the prior year projected amount, it was a, your, your 2020 budget over 2019 projected was for commercial in NPR a 5.4% increase and a 19.3% increase in, in, in Medicaid uh, NPR. And now with your 2020 projected, uh, you're down on commercial at 7.7% and down on Medicaid 13.9%. And so these are, these are pretty volatile numbers. And I'm just wondering, do you attribute all of that to the EMR? Um, yeah, this is uh, Devin Batchelder, Decision Support and Budget Manager. Um, those, those numbers certainly are volatile. Um, you know, the EM, EMR is a component of that as the, the net collection rates really are a weighted average of a number of components. And when some of the more favorable components suffer, um, on the commercial side in particular, um, the, the net is that you end up with a lower collection rate. And so um, we have a favor, more favorable pair mix in our physician practices than in our general uh, hospital service base. Um, so we are missing out on, you know, commercial uh, surgeries and diagnostic imaging, um, which are favorable collection rates. We're missing out on those at a higher rate than other less favorable uh, things. On the Medicaid piece, that's when we get into a lot of the ACO uh, calculations and risk reserves that, that we talked about before. Um, so those, those are the primary drivers on those. So let, let me just connect what you just said to um, uh, your collection rates. Uh, in, your, in your budget, you were looking at a 58% collection rate on commercial, and that's dropping down to 54%. I, given what you said, I, that makes some sense. But the Medicaid rate is dropping from, collection rate is dropping from 46.5% down to 38, a little, uh, little under 39%. That's a fairly significant drop. Uh, so can you kind of tie that change uh, uh, into um, this presentation? Yeah. Um, the other thing on the Medicaid piece, which I didn't mention, is that as you increase your prices, you don't get any new collection. So those, the additional gross charges that come from higher prices are a 0% collection rate. Um, and so that weighs in pretty heavily when we're talking about some of these higher uh, rate requests. Uh, makes sense to me, thank you. Um, so I'm looking at kind of uh, you know, the methodology of, of projected forward here. And uh, on the chart, it was on, uh, we don't have to put it up here, but um, on the chart that uh, 
Patrick uh, uh, presented showing your budget, the one that we got from Robin had up in the top of it a little bit of a kind of a calculation approach, methodology approach, which was basically to take um, the 2020 year to date number and divide it by 152 days and then multiply that by 365. And so as you kind of go down through the projected numbers for bad debt, for free care, for the dish payment, for a net uh, patient revenue, that formula pretty much works. But where it is significantly different is in terms of the calculation of uh, gross patient revenue. If you apply that formula, uh, the gross patient revenue comes up to uh, 221.9 million. And if you apply it to deductions for revenue, that formula comes up to a negative 127.5 million. And those two kind of offset each other, so you come to the same bottom line um, at 108 million. But I'm, I, I'm just wondering, you know, why, why that common projecting approach wasn't used across you know, all, all of these line items? Or was there another methodology? Uh, which specific line items are, are you are you referencing as being different from each other? Say, say that again. I didn't. Uh, too many people were talking. Right. Uh, which particular items are you are you referencing as being different from each other, having different methodology? Okay. So I'll, I'll say let's take a look at gross uh, gross patient revenue. The um, uh, 152 day number to date is 92,430. And if you divide that by the 152 days that that covers times 365, which is the methodology that's been employed uh, on these other line items, that comes to 221 million, and let me just kind of look this up, versus the 218 million uh, that uh, is, is uh, that was presented. And similarly for deductions in revenue, it was that the projected number, the to date number was 53.1 million. Divide that by 152 and multiply by 365 and you, come, and you get a negative 127 million. And those two offset each other, but I'm, I'm I, uh, so you get to the same bottom line, but I'm just wondering why the different approach, why that, that approach that Robin laid out at the, at the, at the top of her presentation um, wasn't, uh, um, followed on these two on these two lines. Um, yeah, and and that's related to the seasonality of the revenue. Um, the 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 152 over 365 approach is that straight annualization. The projection we used in uh, method we used in producing the file was to look at our percent variance from budget and then look at our seasonally adjusted budget and maintain that level of variation as a percentage of budget. Um, so that's that's why that gross revenue number is a little lower. Our summers are typically slower. We we have higher inpatient volumes in the winter during during your typical flu and pneumonia season. Okay, um, I'm just curious in terms of the 5.8 million dollars in uh, revenue change for FF the line item for FPP reserves and other um, that uh, isn't part of this, but it's certainly sit there, sitting there in the background. Uh, are there any expense offsets associated with that revenue loss? This is Stephanie, no, there are not, because the only real expenses that would go into that to begin with would be our dues um, to one care, so. Which are a, about a million dollars a year. Yep. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Member Lunch. Thank you. Um, so my, my first question I wanted to ask you about was to talk in a little more granularity about uh, the application of the charge increases in terms of which services those would impact. Okay, I, this is Stephanie, I can speak to that. Um, so our plan is to um, increase our hospital-based charges um, by I think it's 19.5% um, and then the professional fees we would not increase. 
And again, the reason for that and for not doing it across the board, if we were to do an across the board increase, then the value of 1% of increase for us would change just because of the nature of how the payers reimburse those professional fees. It's all really fee service, and so we don't want to, you know, go, you know, applying price increases, which is going to be, you know, and I'll, lack of a better term, a waste of everyone's time because there would be no impact. And the other thing that we try to do is, you know, really look at where we have our current professional fees set, and we want to, to a large extent, make those attractive because we want to encourage folks to continue to get primary care. And if you have a high deductible plan or you don't have insurance at all, we still want you to come in and see your primary care provider and be able to afford whatever the, you know, gross charge is associated with just a regular office visit. And so we felt like the most, you know, appropriate thing for us to do with this particular rate increase would be to apply it only to those hospital-based charges and then to still remain competitive on things like surgery, diagnostic imaging, lab. We also also take that into consideration any time that we're contemplating a change to our charge master. Thanks. So is it an across the board for the hospital-based charges? Yes, it would be. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to go back to the ICU and the telehealth contract with Dartmouth-Hitchcock. How do you expect that telehealth initiative to impact your staffing, in particular your travelers? On two levels. One, right now, we have to have 100% of the expertise needed to care for critically ill patients in-house, 100% of the time. So what tele-ICU, and I will look to Dr. Brophy if he wants to jump in from the clinical side, but our expectation is that by having that level of monitoring where we do have patients that maybe are just barely critically ill, but we have a nurse and staff that can flex between our med surge patients and that may be one critically ill patient with the support of remote monitoring from Dartmouth. That is going to give us two things. One, the ability to probably keep the care local for about 100 more patients a year and then also give us, especially overnight, that flexibility of staffing where we've got basically three levels of service of care that we're trying to staff instead of four because we're getting the support from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Yeah, Robin, I think you summarized that well. I think it was the doctors, the physicians here at the hospital kind of felt very strongly about keeping that sort of level of care here at NMC. It was something they felt they wanted to do, and this was just a way of kind of ensuring that that would be able to happen for us. So I think that summarizes it pretty well. Can I just add, this is Jessica Holmes, can I just add a small sub-question to Robin's question so we don't have to come back to this? Do you mind, Robin? No, go ahead. I'm just actually wondering if you can quantify the projected net savings with the tele-ICU with Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the timing of that net savings. Sure. We actually expect a combination of savings and revenue growth for an annualized impact of $300,000 a year net revenue or net income impact. The timeline for that is about a six-month implementation. Certainly COVID has impacted that timeline for us, and I wish I could give you more clarity at this point in time when we can begin the implementation, but I can't. And so are you expecting that it will reduce your travelers? It sounds like yes, but I haven't heard you actually say that. Yes. There's the answer. And do you have a sense of how much it would decrease your travelers? 
It would be a land swag, uh, Robin. It's really going to depend on on really how successful are we um, making the right decisions out of the ED around transport versus keeping in house, and then um, the uh, the increase of clinical skill sets that um, will occur over that six months implementation period. Okay, thank you. Um, I was also curious if you have talked with Brattleboro at all about what they had done. They closed their ICU in 2016, but they've, in combination with their telehealth initiative with Dartmouth, have been able to create a progressive unit where they can do higher levels of care and they're able to staff that up and down uh, with the telehealth and their existing staffing um, in a way that was much more efficient than maintaining an ICU. So is that anything that you have explored? Absolutely. In fact, that's why we were talking with Dartmouth and the success of that program um, uh, uh, began that discussion with us locally because we had a lot of the same issues. Okay, thank you. Jess, did you have anything else on ICU? No, I, that was great. Thank you. Um, all right, hold on just a second. I've got to check my notes for my next question. Um, so you had, in your cost reduction slide, you had talked about some uh, service line discontinuation that you had already started um, and that's documented on that slide. Could you speak to what service lines you have discontinued? Lifestyle medicine as a standalone clinic no longer exists. We did retain some elements of that that were appropriate to be embedded in our primary care setting um, to still um, continue in the progress on the triple aim of improving our population health. The other is, um, are in the, is in the process of our hope and recovery uh, program, which is our addiction medicine program. Um, we do have other partners in the community who are desiring to come into to the community to care for those patients. And you also mentioned right sizing rise Vermont. Can you also talk a little bit about what analysis you did in terms of determining uh, what level to fund that? Uh, yes, we compared the level of investment um, that other member or the other state hospitals were providing. Um, we, as you all know, we were early adopters and, and led the way through significant subsidies to um, create that foothold in the state. We feel that um, those efforts and those early investments were appropriate and successful and that now um, our uh, our investment locally should mirror that of what the rest of the state is doing and allow more room for um, the ACO uh, to, to, um, to drive further um, initiatives around population health. Thank you. Uh, in terms of your concierge program, uh, what types of patients were using that program? Uh, what do you mean by type of patient? So when you described it, you mentioned that that program provided transportation, sometimes groceries, some other supports that would, would allow people to recover at home. So I was curious to know if that was a program that was more uh, oriented towards lower income patients or patients with higher deductibles or uh, if you had any sense of the population using that program. Uh, so primarily any patient that that qualified for was an inpatient being discharged and really um, we did not have, it was a program we had in place for any patient expressing a need for help, not that we would transport patients, but that had transportation issues to go and pick up their prescriptions to maybe have groceries or the proper supplies that they would need at home. We would, um, our concierge would go and procure those supplies and have those available for the patients at time of discharge. And so what's happening now for those patients? Unfortunately, those patients are having to find other alternatives to meeting that need. Do you expect it will increase hospitalizations or people remaining inpatient or increase nursing home stays? 
Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, this is Stephanie. Um, you know, I think what we've tried to do is um, tr transfer as much of that that we possibly can to our regular case management staff. Um, so I don't want to give the impression that, you know, eliminating the concierge program has eliminated our commitment to um, helping our patients with any of those social determinants. Um, so we certainly still have um, funding. We certainly still have resources in place. Um, but it is a loss for our organization because what we're missing now is, you know, those couple of friendly bodies that would round um, with our inpatient population every single morning and just say, hey, is there something that I can do for you? Is there something that you need? Um, and because for some folks, you know, they would go everywhere from upstairs on Family Birth Center and help out new mom and dad, and they would be in that medical surgical area as well. Um, so it could be something as easy as, you know, a newspaper or takeout from a particular restaurant that they were just craving like crazy. Um, but the more serious items, um, we are still really committed to dealing with those um, through case management and through the, you know, funding that we have in place with that program. Thank you. That was helpful. Uh, additional info. Um, so in terms of the, the electronic medical record challenges, uh, what assistance, if any, did Quorum offer to you in terms of ensuring that the implementation at the hospital went smoothly? Um, this is Stephanie again. I mean, we, we certainly regularly partner with Quorum when we've got a large project going on, like an EMR implementation. Um, we make sure that they know what our project timeline looks like, what our spend looks like. Um, but I would have to say that from a day-to-day -day operational standpoint, um, they have been supportive to us, but not um, a physical presence here in the hospital that's really helping us troubleshoot these issues. Um, they've been completely supportive um, in our conversations with Meditech about what our difficulties have been, um, just like the leadership here at the hospital and just like the board of directors. Um, but I, I would probably have to say that you know, as a separate resource, um, there, there were not able to say, you know, oh, we have these 10 other clients who have also recently upgraded to this particular version of Meditech, and so let's, you know, get the best of all of these minds together and figure out what this hospital has done versus what you are doing to help you try to find some efficiencies. We weren't able to find that through Quorum, but we did do that work on our own um, by going to Meditech, asking for the names of the other clients, making sure that we were um, doing these types of meetings with those hospitals to understand what they had done differently that we might be able to implement. So even though it wasn't through Quorum, that work was still able to happen. And this is Robin, I would just add to that, um, and keep in mind that this web ambulatory um, product, um, we were an early adopter of, and I think that that may be something that we haven't focused um, enough attention on is that, you know, typically, and I can tell you I was involved with some of the early EPIC installations in Atlanta back 10 years ago. You know, you learn as you go, and being an early adopter has its benefits, but it also um, has uh, certainly some negatives, and I think that those were more than anticipated. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'll just I comment. Uh, I think any early adopter, and quite frankly, any electronic medical system, it's not unanticipated that a revenue drop will be the result because of the workflow issue. So. Uh, I'm not particularly surprised, although I am disappointed in terms of the the length of time uh, of the impact from that. Um, I don't have any further questions, Kevin. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Member Holmes. Okay, great. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation and, and um, a lot of great questions already. Uh, I wanted to talk about in your letter, Robin, uh, your letter outlined that as you evaluate services, you look at both the financial performance and the importance of, to our community of retaining that service. And so um, building a little bit on Robin's question, in your 2019 community needs assessment, obesity was actually one of your community's top three priorities. And NMC's plan to address that top three priority was increasing Rise Vermont uh, expenditures and expanding offerings of the lifestyle team, lifestyle medicine team. So I'm seeing that both of those programs have been cut 
uh, you're adding a fleet program, which I don't remember seeing as one of the uh, lists of priorities or needs in your community. So I recognize you're, you know, you, you have some choices to make, and I, w I would love to hear more about how you're making those choices, given this is a priority in your community, and it seems to be the first to go. So I would say that um, please keep in mind that we had both Rise Vermont, which is more of a community outreach um, program. We also had lifestyle medicine, um, which was more direct intervention with, um, with patients who had chronic disease um, or obesity. Um, the, the elimination of, of lifestyle medicine was as a standalone clinic. We still have health coaches. We still have um, dietitians and nutritionists. Those are just embedded now in primary care when we achieve some scale in providing those services. With Rise Vermont, um, in particular, I think that um, uh, that to right size that investment at this point in time um, was the right decision. But you know, at the end of the day, this is we know this rate increase isn't going to get us where we need to be. We know our scale isn't certainly isn't there. We know our community has needs. But we're faced with significant choices of, of greater good, and a combination of that has to be, you know, a revenue strategies as well as cost containment. Um, our discussions with um, One Care around their plans for Rise Vermont, as well as our, as our own understanding and preserving um, still a presence in our communities. It's not the entire program. Um, it is just reducing the investment from almost a million dollars a year to something that is more um, more in line with what our finances can subsidize right now without eliminating it completely. Okay. Um, going along those similar lines, you, you mentioned as we evaluate those services that result in a negative contribution margin, margin, we have to prioritize them according to need of service in the community and availability of the service through other organizations in the local community or in Chittenden County. So first I want to say that it's wonderful to hear that hospitals can in fact estimate contribution margins because we had heard otherwise. Um, so it validates that this actually can be done and, and must be done and it validates the importance of, of what some of the board is doing with sustainability planning and service line optimization. I want to throw out there, the ICU has come up a number of times, and I'm, you know, and I'm sure you're doing this analysis, but it would be helpful for us to understand, you know, keeping the ICU open versus closing the ICU versus having a sort of a Brattleboro telemedicine uh, model, uh, understanding, you know, you have an academic medical center down the road that has an ICU. You know, it sounds like there's been some capacity constraints there that have left you with this other option of, of relying on Dartmouth Hitchcock, helping us understand a little bit of, you know, how often is it the case that you have somebody that you would transport but other but cannot because the ICU at UVM is at full capacity, would be helpful in understanding some of the decisions you're making around uh, service lines and where some of your pain points are in terms of your expenses. It looks like the ICU is one of those pain points. but. What are some of the trajectories that you've considered? And you've answered some of this already, but I wonder a little bit more if you could help me understand what happens with UVM and their capacity there and why that is not an option. Sure. Well, first let me clarify your statement around contribution margins and service lines. I think that's the key word. And service line is much different than at a department level. And I think where we've expressed challenges has been at the department level and not service line level. Okay. Um, Secondly, around um, the UVM partnership, we had, um, and you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brophy, um, uh, Mike can can speak to this. Um, Dr. Minadeo um, certainly could, being um, our CNQO and also an emergency room provider. We had a hundred instances for sure, because that was the. Um, number that we looked at of patients that um, where if we did have a partnership with Dartmouth that we could have seen rather than um, uh, um, transporting to UVM. 
I am happy to follow up with those exact numbers, but I can tell you it happens frequently, and you can probably speak um, with even other affiliated hospitals. Um, this is not a, a criticism of our tertiary partner at all. It is simply a byproduct of the growth. They're the growth center in our state. It's the po one area where the population is growing, and they are trying to meet that need for the entire state. So I think decisions like Brattleboro that they made, decisions that we're making where we can actually extend up our acuity level of patients that we can maintain, I think will actually impact positively on our tertiary partner to care for more of the sick of the sick instead of those patients being put at risk hanging out in an ED or on a floor where there's not um, the appropriate skill set 100% um, of the time to take care of those patients. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'd love to hear more about that, maybe through the budget process, you know, going further, understanding where the capacity constraints are. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the EMR productivity losses and the EMR impact. And it was mentioned, I think, in your letter, too, about $4 million of the $7 million variance came from a decrease in ortho volume. And I had this recollection from the budget hearing that um, NMC was losing ortho revenue because providers were requiring patients appropriately, I think, to do some obesity reduction and some uh, PT prep work prior to surgery. And we heard from the leadership team at the budget hearings that that had two results. One. Hi, this is Stephanie. I can, yeah, I can speak to this one. Um, so we are, um, you know, still doing some pilot work and around the, what we call um, prehab and um, that seems to be going really well and we're you know committed to continuing to do that i think actually related to some of what was done uh oh are you am hey, i jeff, not mute this whole time jess you uh somehow muted yourself and stephanie was already answering your question in anticipation so maybe stephanie okay. you could start again <laughs> okay sorry i don't know how i muted myself <laughs> All right, thanks. No, I'll start again. Um, yeah, we definitely have done some pilot work and some great work around what we call prehab. And so we started that in our ortho um, department. So how do we, you know, work with our health coaches, which, we, you know, like Robin said, we still have, um, and how do we work with physical therapy to make sure that patients are prepared as possible um, to have successful surgeries and successful outcomes. So we had already anticipated um, a small reduction in volumes related to that work, um, but this four million is a further reduction in volumes that we did not date. Really the most impactful because those surgeries are the highest dollar. Right, so because that is a physician practice where they convert visits into surgeries and those surgeries are high dollar, um, that's really what's creating that $4 million and, and why that is such a standout number for us in that department in particular. Okay, but not, probably not related to some of the change in clinical protocols. You had already anticipated that in your estimate. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just, I'm also trying to figure out a little bit about in your submission in Northwest, I'm trying to, you know, unpack a little bit of these productivity losses. And I noticed in your submission, April 23rd, around, you know, the fiscal year to date summary, that in your 2020 budget, you had 42 physician FTEs. And um, as of, you know, February, you had 32. And there was also a drop off in non MD FTEs, uh, 676 down to 650, 651. So I'm also wondering, that seems like, and particularly physician FTEs, you know, a 25% drop in physician FTEs, seems like that could be contributing to your reduction in, in productivity and in physician visits and all of that, perhaps unrelated to EMR. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to what's happening with your staffing. Um, I know you've talked about some programs you've cut, but that doesn't seem to match up. The, the, the program cuts that have been made already don't seem to match up with the magnitude of the reduction in staff. So could you speak to that and how much that relates to productivity losses? Yeah, 
that you're seeing, revenue losses that you're seeing, the reduction in MDs and non-MD FTEs? Sure. I think probably that MD number warrants us to go back and take a second look at it because we are small enough of an organization that we know our MD list, and I don't think we have had a reduction um, that is that significant. I can only think of maybe three um, off the top of my head. So we will absolutely take a look at that. Um, but one thing I did do while I was prepping um, for this presentation was go look at total FTEs for the organization and when we sat in front of you guys back in August um, and said, you know, we've really got some work to do and we're committed to doing it. At that time we had 701 um, total FTEs in our organization and as of today we have about 670. Um, so we have come down um, over 30 FTEs but it is not that drastic on a provider level that is mostly with the exception of, like I said, about three I can think of off the top of my head um, that is mostly non-physician and non-provider staff. And I would just yep. add, I would just add to that, especially in ortho, we did have um, uh, locums providers uh, mm -hmm. um, still there, so they may have appeared under contract services as opposed to uh, FTE provider line. Jess, can I ask a follow up to that question? Of course. So. Um, in your um, presentation that you uh, sent to us prior to today, you had listed um, 1.3 million in non-management payroll reductions and a little over 500,000 in management payroll deductions. And you were just talking about a reduction in FDEs. Is the, that full amount of those two, are the, is that strictly um, related to a reduction in force or is there any compensation reductions there? That, go ahead. So on, if you're referring to the slide that it says what ha, what we have already done, yes. those, those were factored in and included, those reductions were included in our budget number. But to answer your question, this is Stephanie, they are reductions in FTEs. We did do um, a small, um, cost of living type increase for our staff for this year when it comes to raises. However, we did none um, at the management and above level. Um, so we have not reduced wages across the board, um, but we have done either none or, or small um, salary increases. But the dollars that are listed on the slide are not a result of you know doing salary reductions, they really are a result of elimination of positions. Thank you, Jess. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about days cash on hand. Um, so as of February, uh, Northwest is the second highest in the state of days cash on hand. Um, pretty close to first, actually, and you're projecting that if no other changes are made, you'd be down to 182 days cash on hand, um, which, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around what an increase in rate would put Northwest at in terms of rate growth over time and, and commercial rate ask. I just want to point out that the median days cash on hand um, for the state is about 117, 115, something like that. So. Uh, I want to ask you, you know, in terms of think about our position here and, and where we are, and, you know, you could uh, take 15 days cash on hand and have the same adjustment to your bottom line as a commercial rate ask increase of, of 15%. So why not use days cash on hand if you use the 15 days that you would potentially be using if not, no other adjustment would be made, you'd still be well above the median for the state of Vermont. Can you speak to that a bit? So I guess um, with all due respect, I would probably say is the median for the state of Vermont correct given the impact that COVID has had on hospitals and I think illustrating the need for um, some cash on reserve. Um, secondly, I think for us, um, we have a bond covenant of 100 days and that means that when we get, we're already out of compliance with our debt ratio on our bond covenant. 
uh, that means that the closer we get to 100 days increases the likelihood that our bond could be called and we would be at zero days. Um, so I'd just like to offer that context and then Stephanie, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I would just add that, you know, I, again, I know I know what the state median is, um, but I also, you know, respectfully think that that is too low, and I think that it makes our system too fragile. And so I look to Northwestern and hold us at the standard of, you know, rating ourselves in hospitals across the country, which is kind of why we choose to use that S&P um, as our benchmark. And then I think the only other thing I would say is, you know, regardless of what the number is today or what the number might be at September 30, as, you know, someone with, you know, fiduciary responsibility within this organization, I look at the trajectory of our day's cash on hand and what it has done over the past five years um, knowing that some of that was intentional because of our master facility plan and our renovation that we did, but the amount of it that is unintentional is what's absolutely, you know, concerning to me and alarming to me. So um, I think that all, all of us should be striving to keep that number healthy, um, not striving to see how low we can go um, and putting ourselves in an absolute crisis mode. Yeah, no, of course, and I, don't, I recognize the need to keep days cash on hand, and I agree that the state, we would love to see the state at a higher level across every single hospital, of course, during COVID-19. But we also have to recognize the commercial rate increase is passed on to, you know, patients and consumers who are now facing unemployment. They're now facing, you know, uh, potentially significant, you know, hardship in trying to make and meet their premiums. So. There's a balance, you know, the money doesn't, we have to figure out where the money could come from and who can best afford it. So that's part of the question there. But I, I, I hear you completely. I wish everybody stays cash on hand were a lot higher. Uh, two quick more questions and then I'm done. Uh, have you approached Viva at all for any type of financial relief? Uh, we have done, I don't know if by Diva you mean, um, you know, CMS, or do you specifically mean Diva? No, I mean Medicaid. I mean the state, yes. AHS, Diva, yeah. We have not. Uh, any particular reason? Um, I, I guess I would kind of ask for an example of what kind of financial relief you would have in mind. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I think other hospitals have ha, have approached Diva in other ways about loans, about. So I'm just I'm curious if that ever entered into the um, into the thought process of you know you've got multiple payers here. Medicare is not going to you know Medicare may be tough, and we're making some asks with related to the ACO, and then there's commercial payers and Medicaid. So I'm just was curious as to whether any exploration was done about whether or not there might be relief there from that pair. But yeah, it sounds like not, so we can move on. Um, and then my last question was actually related to federal money, and uh, I know this this ask is not related to COVID-19, but um, even, you know, you mentioned earlier that some of the day's cash on hand reduction is related to, for example, investment income that's fallen. So there is a, uh, an impact here that's still to some degree being considered in this ask. Fully, I recognize not the operating cost of COVID relief and all of that. But I'm just wondering, now that you have some sense of what the federal money that's coming in for that COVID relief, has, does that change any of your calculus on the needs of the hospital in general? Yeah, I mean, it's still early, but we are certainly staying on top of, you know, what stimulus money is available, and we are going through our FEMA application process just like everybody else is. Um, I would say at this point, um, you know, if I were to take, you know, my best guess at what day's cash on hand might look like with the impact of COVID, but with um, also adding back in any sort of relief that we are going to get in the way of stimulus money, um, we may see that day's cash on hand be somewhere around 150, um, 150 days. Okay, but you're saying 182 would be where you would be with nothing. So how does it go down to 150 then with stimulus? So 182 is without the COVID impact right. other than the loss on our investment portfolio. Oh, okay. So Thank now you. that we... Okay. okay, got it, got it. 
Okay, well, I, that's the end of my questions, and I, I know they're tough questions. You know, it's a tough ask that you're making, and but I appreciate the hardship that the hospital is in and the difficulties that you are facing, and I appreciated your honesty with all of, you know, your answers to my questions. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I will be very brief since we have passed the noon hour. Um, in the past, Northwest has been um, penalized by the federal government um, for failure to meet uh, quality measures. Has that been rectified? And do you anticipate any um, penalty for this year? Um, we've certainly moved in the right direction. So I'm not sure of any organization that's perfect. Um, but when I look at our provider statistical and reimbursement reports and I trend them back over the last, you know, three or four fiscal years, we are losing less money because of things like hospital-acquired conditions and readmissions and value-based purchasing type adjustments. We have lost less money every single year for at least the last three years in a row. And I would just, this is Robin, I would just add to that, you know, last fall we did make the decision to create um, as a full-time position our chief medical and quality officer, and we have also made investments in our quality department, and that is on our strategic plan to improve our quality and safety as a high reliability organization um, and part of the operating plan for this year. So while we're on the, the topic of federal government, um, it's our understanding that the um, majority of hospitals received their second stimulus payment on Friday and that it uh, took into account the corrections for the improper payment in the first round. Did you likewise receive that payment and was yours corrected? We did and it was corrected. Thank you. Um, this isn't a question, but just a, a comment. You know, you try to make some lemonade out of lemons, and you know, this whole mess that we're in today is um, really a bad situation. But one of the positives that I would hope to see is that a number of healthcare professionals working in large metropolitan areas may wish to relocate to Vermont, and it may be one of the things that helps us with our tremendous workforce shortage. I'm not saying it's the be all or the end all, but I would hope that over time we're gonna see a reduction in travelers because people are gonna see the real value of being able to live in an area where they can have social distance, they can grow their own food, um, they can feel much safer than where they are today. So you don't have to respond to that. That's just a comment on my part. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, the public, and I understand that um, Sarah Teachout um, has a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, this is Sarah Teachout, from, um, the government relations person from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, and I just wanted to, I believe, clarify um, Blue Cross's position towards this request. Um, we are neither supporting nor opposing um, this rate increase. Um, we were notified um, of the request by Northwestern, um, and I don't believe we responded in any way other than to contact them about our advanced payment program. Um, and what we are advocating for and would hope that the Green Mountain Care Board looks at is a system-wide solution to this healthcare crisis and the funding of our rural community hospitals. So Sarah, I would agree with that, that we should be looking at it system-wide, but to focus strictly on today's hearing, um, the request has been said that this is not related to COVID, that it's pre-COVID uh, events. And focusing on that and knowing what we've seen in the past, is there anything in their contract that would guarantee them a 14.9% rate increase if we uh, granted it to them? Uh, no. Okay, which goes back to the burden of proof, which I stated at the, the beginning that I think was on the applicant to um, do a little bit more homework with the carriers to see if a decision um, actually could be implemented. Other members of the public who wish to comment? Hi, yes, this is Julia Shot with the Healthcare Advocate. Go ahead, Julia. 
Thank you. Um, so I just have two brief comments from the HCA. Uh, first, uh, we understand that the board might be adjusting some of its procedures because of the context that we're in with COVID, um, but we would like to, to request a special public comment period on this proposal. Um, I'm not sure whether it was an issue on our end or on your end, but the HCA did not receive any of these materials in advance. Um, and we just would sort of appreciate the opportunity to review them more thoroughly. Um, second, as both board members and-, and So as Julia, as not, on that oh, first point, yep. Yep. you know, um, we even um, announced, um, I believe last week or the week before that this hearing was going to take place. It's been out there in the public. Um, they're, they're looking to um, get an increase that would be effective as of tomorrow. And I'm worried about, um, I, I don't wanna just put out an, a period of public comment if, if there's not gonna be legitimate public comment. And I don't know um, why you did not receive anything in advance. I'll look into that and assure you that it wasn't intentional. And, um, but I'm just curious um, if you truly believe that something of value would come out of extending a public comment period and thus not allowing us to vote on this request today? Um, I mean, I think in addition to, I mean, we would appreciate the opportunity to re review the materials and potentially submit a written comment. And I think um, in general, you know, we advocate for the public having an opportunity to comment, particularly on something that will have a significant impact on consumers. And also, it sounded like even if the if something was approved for May first, that it wouldn't be implemented for quite a while. Is that correct? Well, that's an interpretation. And uh, the question that I have, though, is really how much time do you need? Oh, um, I mean, I think for us, like maybe Monday would be fine. <laughs> Okay. Which puts us in the awkward position of having to uh, warn another meeting, but that's okay. Um, we'll consider that. Um, okay. You had a second question? I did, yeah, I, just a comment. Um, I just wanted to you know, acknowledge as both board members and NMC have that this proposal would be a substantial price increase that would have a real impact on Vermonters. Um, I think we all know that Vermonters can't afford this increase. Um, and we also just wanted to note that it doesn't seem totally clear to us how the increase will actually address NMC's revenue issues in the current context of COVID. Um, so we would just um, echo the request of others that the hospital and the board consider other avenues for looking at the revenue shortfall, um, including the options suggested by board member Holmes and also um, the systemic approach uh, suggested by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Is there a question in there? Or? No, just a comment. Okay. Did you have anything else, Julia? Nope, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Other members of the public? Ham Davis. Go ahead, Ham. We can. We can. Uh, thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a couple of questions, uh, especially given that a major piece of central point of this request is an ICU. Could, uh, could the hospital tell us uh, how many, um, how many COVID patients has uh, Northwest had since March 3rd and how many of those required an ICU? Hi, this is Stephanie. Um, I'm, I may be off by one or two, um, but I believe that we have had uh, 12 um, COVID admissions um, since everything started. We've been managing as many people we can um, that we know have tested positive on an outpatient basis, but at least 12 of them did require admission. Um, and out of those 12, I believe that um, about half, um, six to seven of them required um, care, ICU level care, and or you know needing to be on a bed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, what I would just, Ham, Dr. I would Brooks, just yeah. Stephanie, Ham. I think 
those numbers yeah. sound about right to me. I think half of them um, required um, or maybe not quite half needed ventilatory support uh, in the ICU. Can I just say something, Ham, too, is that um, yeah. is this is not something that is unique to Northwest, that there's more capacity than, than need. And um, the, the strict reality is, is that Vermont prepared for a scenario that is much worse than that we've seen, which is a good thing. You know, our hospitals were not overrun and um, but they were asked to be prepared in case um, the initial um, analysis and projections came to uh, fruition. So I don't think that any hospital in Vermont should be penalized if they have um, more staff to deal with COVID than, than what the reality is because they were asked to be prepared. Yeah, and I, 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 I this is that Senator, this is Dr. Brophy, thank you for that. Um, there was substantial work put into the preparation and we might add this is not guaranteed to be over. We just don't know what's going to happen once we start uh, opening things up again and people start circulating in the public and furthermore what might happen in the fall. So um, those, are, those, are, those are good points. But uh, Kevin, it just, I, I, I wasn't questioning that. I'm, I, obviously everybody had to prepare the question is the uh, the, the, the if you posit that you're gonna the the once you come out of the once you come out of the COVID period, um, th what you have to do, then the uh, then the cost of uh, building an a an ICU is 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 um, is excessive. And if you can, if we this is this COVID uh, COVID thing, this emergency is the first one like it we've had in a hundred years. And so the, uh, so I'm just saying the, the question is how, how you manage uh, to have a f affordable cost going forward. L giving that, so I'll just let me ask my second question, Kevin, then, then I'm done. And that is, uh, I'd ask the hospital, have they done a, some kind of cost accounting, cost accounting uh, analysis? Of what the what what you would come out what they would what what, what a new IC, a, a new or increased size ICU would cost going forward. Uh, this is Stephanie. I guess I'm just confused. We're not um, as part of our rate request. Um, we're not proposing any changes um, to our current ICU, and so there would be no dollars being spent, and none of this rate increase would be applied toward anything um, related to our ICU. Thank you. I'm done, Kevin. Thank you, Ham. Are there other members of the public? Hearing none, board, we have a couple of issues to uh, deal with. There's been a request um, for a public comment period. Um, I'm just wanting to uh, get some thoughts from my uh, colleagues on the board on uh, that issue. And if um, the answer is that um, it, it's not important to members of the board, I, I shouldn't phrase it that way, but um, is there a need for the public comment period? Probably there is, um, and I'll take uh, the blame if uh, on this issue. Uh, at the same time, um, I don't know. I'll, I'll just throw it over to my colleagues to see where they're coming from. Well, this is Robin. Um, I you know, always favor a public comment period, quite frankly, because I think it is an important part of our transparency. Um, I also think that it may provide a few days to get some clarity around the insurer contract term, um, because I do think uh, the timeline for implementation of the rate increase is an important consideration at least for me in uh, my decision making. And currently, what I feel like I heard is that uh, most likely from the date of our decision, assuming they notified the carriers immediately, there would be at least a 60-day delay in implementing, which then makes tomorrow's 
request date less important. Not that we should drag our heels or anything like that, but um, it, I, I would be surprised if even if we decided today that tomorrow would be the implementation date. So let me ask the court reporter, if we were to um, have a special meeting in the board on Monday at one o'clock, would you be able to cover it? Uh, just hold one second, I have to look at my calendar. Kevin, I can't do a one o'clock meeting Monday. I can do in the morning. What if we were to do a 10.30 to 11.30 time? That I think a lot of folks have blocked off on their calendar. Just so you know, the court reporter's off the record <laughs> while you're okay. trying this. Okay. Let, let's uh, suggest 10 o'clock on Monday then. Does that work for everybody? Works for me. Yes. Yes, yes. the court reporter can be available at 10 on Monday. Okay, then we'll make the decision that we will not um, entertain a motion uh, on this today that we will open up a period of public comment, which will be opened immediately, and we'll end at um, 8 a.m. Monday morning. And with that, um, it should not be a long meeting, um, but there could be some uh, very long board discussion. Does any member of the board wish to begin discussion today, or would, does everyone prefer to hold it to Monday at 10? I don't have a strong opinion, although I certainly wouldn't mind hearing if people had immediate thoughts. Yeah, I'm fine either way, knowing that we have a one o'clock um, meeting starting as well. So um, the only public comment that I would have, Robin, is that um, I have said all along that um, Every hospital is in a different position than where they were at the beginning of the uh, year's budget process and that um, there is gonna have to be a holistic uh, look at the whole system. But um, I have also struggled with what a vote would even mean if we're, we've heard testimony from an insurer that it doesn't necessarily result in that increase so um, I'm, I guess my comment is that uh, I'm, I'm just not at a position where I feel comfortable granting the type of request that's before us at this time, um, but also acknowledging the fact that everything that Northwest was encountering um, was encountered pre-COVID and so, um, I recognize the position that they're in. So that would be the only comment I would have at this time. Any other board member wish to comment now or you can wait till Monday morning at 10? Well, my, my comment is that, um, you know, as I started off with my question, kind of painting some context for Northwestern and, and uh, I don't think they've been um, one of the best advantaged position-wise uh, hospitals in Vermont. Um, but I also sense that a lot of this current, this request is temporary. There's a lot of, independent of COVID, et cetera, there's a lot of, uh, of um, uh, softness about it in the sense of the, the EMR issues and <clears throat> the FPP issue, which is out there to be resolved, the COVID issues are out there to be resolved. Um, so, um, but I, you know, it, it's and it's a small amount of money relative to uh, 3.8 million is what they would raise over the rest of the year, um, and still have you know large problems, um, you know, in their in their bottom line. So, um, a 15 percent rate increase is a big increase. Um, if there are a way to make it uh, temporary so that it would help them, you know, get through this year and and solve a little bit of their bottom line problem. Um, you know, I might be open to that, I have, but I, you know, it's, it's something that we haven't talked about and I would want to hear from staff, et cetera, as to what their thoughts were. 
other board members. Yeah, I guess this is Jessica. I, I struggle with the temporary versus the permanent. A lot of the issues seem to be a temporary problem and uh, rate increase is permanent. It's forever baked into rates going forward. So I, I, that's something that I'm thinking about. I don't know, you know, back to your point, Kevin, about the, the carriers. Is there a mechanism by which the NMC can go negotiate with the carriers for a solution, albeit probably temporary or, or something else, and come back to us with something that's been negotiated, which went then we might be able to evaluate. Is that a possible path forward or no? Well, I think that NMC could do more with the carriers prior to the hearing today, um, but it, that may be a task that uh, is not feasible on the time frame that we have in front of us, Jess. So may I just add one clarifying comment about the payers? Um, our contracts allow with prior notification for us to do a, a rate increase, so I'm not sure what um, Sarah was referring to in terms of it being guaranteed. Now, certainly our professional services are on fee schedule, so it would be not applicable, and we've talked about that, that this would be on the hospital side. Certainly we can provide that contract language to the board um, before uh, Monday. That is not an issue. So I would suggest that you give us the uh, three largest uh, commercial payers the language strictly related to a mid-year adjustment. I know that, um, that you may have some restrictions in your contract about what is uh, public knowledge, and you could um, send those with a request to um, our council to treat them as confidential if you so desire. Thank you. Anyone else from the board? Hearing none, I'm going, to, I'm going to recess this meeting until 10 a.m. Monday morning. Um, an immediate public comment period will be open until 8 a.m. Monday morning, and um, we will pick off at 10 where we left off today. And also remind everyone that the regular board meeting for the Green Mountain Care Board will commence at 1 o'clock um, this afternoon. And so I urge everybody to run quickly and get something to eat and take whatever nature break you need.